a pastor friend on Facebook made the grave mistake of asking for opinions on this book. The title is The Comparative Readability of the Authorized Version. And I made a mistake initially because I saw that the author was D.A. Waite, but I didn't notice that it was D.A. Waite Jr. D.A. Waite is one of the leading King James Onlyists out there. He's been involved with the Dean Bergen Society for quite a number of years. And if I could recall correctly the name, I would tell you of his newsletter that he's put out for quite some time. Suffice it to say, I'm very familiar with D.A. Waite. I had kind of forgotten that he had a son, Junior, D.A. Waite Jr., who himself has B.A.M.A. and M.L.A. I think that's a uh, library services kind of degree. I'm not sure what he studied and where. I might have known that in the past. This book was put out quite some years ago. It was, I think, 1996. Yeah, D.A. Waite Th.D. and Ph.D., the dad, has written the foreword. He recommends the work of his son, and it was put out by Oda. That's the name of D.A. Waite's ministry, Sr., the Bible for today. Comparative readability of the authorized version. Of course, I'm going to be interested in anybody's efforts on this score, be they in the King James-only world or not. And I have to admit, as I ordered this book, bought it with my own money, $12 and something from Amazon. I was wondering, okay, is he going to come up with something I haven't seen or heard of before? Uh, Is he going to have an argument that I haven't anticipated or already encountered? And the answer is no. (laughs) That's the spoiler for the video. Everything D.A. Waite Jr. says in this book is something I handled in my book, authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible. I have a whole chapter on the readability tests that supposedly demonstrate with scientific accuracy that the King James is totally readable, in fact, just as, if not more readable than the contemporary English translations against which it is often considered. My chapter four is what is the reading level of the King James Version? And put very simply, if D.A. Waite Jr. had been able to read my chapter, even though I was only 15 at the time when this was published, and therefore my own book was not quite ready yet, he wouldn't have had to write this, and he wouldn't have had to go to the self-confessed many, many hours of labor necessary to produce this. I have some tabs in here. I'm going to try to go fairly quickly through and mention some of the things that I noticed in this book. Give it an evaluation. First, the book is absolutely chock full of these charts, and my hat does go off. It's why I'm not wearing a hat right now to D.A. Waite Jr. for Yes, the incredible amount of labor this took. Every one of these boxes that's filled in on this chart meant some minutes and total them all up, and it's hours and hours. He's doing syllable and word averages for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different Bible translations, the RSV, the New King James, the King James, the New American Standard, the American Standard, the New Revised Standard, and the NIV in this case. And he's got um, various methods of averaging It's all very intricate, but one thing that I've learned in the evaluation of statistics is you'll hear this concept of the statistically significant difference. So you'll often see on graphs that are done by responsible polling organizations, you know, uh, what's President so-and-so's approval rating, there will actually be a plus or minus 2% or plus or minus up to maybe 4% sort of uh, margin of error, they call it. And sometimes that will actually be baked into the visual of the graph that they produce. And differences uh, in statistics are not always statistically significant. That is... There may be differences, but because of that margin of error, there really isn't much to speak about. There's not a real matter of substance involved. In this uh, matter of the readability of the Bible, the whole book tends to presume, uh, and the whole last, like, page after page after page is full of these charts. The book presumes that readability is something that can be distilled down to a number, and I just question that premise right from the get-go. That just isn't the case. 
So I look at these graphs, and the first one I'm seeing, um, the New Testament syllables per word averages have the King James Version at spot three. And it, the, the average syllables per word in the King James New Testament are 1.33 whereas the New King James is 1.31. And actually, when he puts together three different measures that I won't exactly uh, explain, he's, he's really fastidious about this. Again, my hat goes off to him. He um, comes up with a, a decimal that goes to the thousandth. So the King James is an average of 1.323 syllables in the New Testament, and the RSV 1.310. The NASB, interestingly, is exactly the same as the King James, 1.323. The American Standard Version, 1.327. The NRSV, 1.327. What I want to know is, why even bother explaining and then relating such a minuscule difference? That will become even more obvious by the end of the video why I think it's not even worth doing. But let me just notice that. Next, this is where we get into the critique that I made of using readability analyses on the King James Version. Of course, what does it mean to analyze the readability of the King James? To a man like D.A. Waite Jr., it means counting. Counting syllables in words, counting words in sentences, counting sentences in paragraphs, shall we say. I don't think that one actually comes up. I think it's really just um, short words versus long words, short sentences versus long sentences. And computers can do that really well. Computers can tally up the length of all kinds of things and count and average like nobody's business. But is that really the way that we discover the readability of something? Before I get into more specifics from, specifics from the book, I wanted to give an illustration. Let's imagine that somebody says, Germans must be better at basketball because, on average, Germans are, are three inches taller than, you know, whatever nationality you want to give, Djiboutians, I don't know, uh, Americans, Canadians, what have you. And you could say, well, okay, but that's not the only factor. Yes, if you isolate for that factor, other things being equal, a guy who's taller may be better at basketball, I would say is likely to be better at basketball. Sometimes you see a guy on the sidewalk, or certainly when you're a coach, and you see a guy coming into school and you say, I want this guy on my basketball team. Or you can just tell that guy is made for basketball. And you ask him, and yeah, sure enough, I've, I've done that. I can, to this day, pick out body types for football positions. I played tackle football years ago. I was a quarterback and a kicker and a punter, and believe it or not, I was a left guard and a tackle. I can't remember if I was left tackle or right tackle, but especially like it was my, it was my like eighth or ninth grade year. Um, I skipped ninth grade. Long story, but I was playing in a league. I was the quarterback. I really enjoyed doing that, and I'm still sort of a quarterback at Frisbee. I play handler, which is the main thrower um, on a given team. So I know something about American sports and world sports, and I can tell to some degree, you know, just by looking at somebody. Sometimes he probably plays such and such sport, and, you know, more often than not, I'm right if I check. But this whole book acts as if there is no other things being equal. We are only measuring the height of people, and Germans are definitively better at basketball than every other nationality because they have the tallest people in the world. That's the style of argumentation. And, you know, the questions just come very naturally. Okay, but do they even play basketball in Germany? Wouldn't that be a relevant factor? What if the style of basketball they play there is different? I don't know. There are all kinds of other factors. Is it a wealthy enough nation to have enough people who have the free time on their hands to play basketball? I mean, they're just all kinds of questions that come up. Are the most athletic people in that nation more inclined to go to soccer or possibly to volleyball? You can't just talk about the height of people when it comes to basketball skill. There's all kinds of other factors involved. Likewise with these computer-based readability analyses. When in, let's see, the, what section is it here? I have it marked with all these tabs. The second tab I have in here, he says short word versus long word. Um, you know, he gives this chart 
he, he asks, according to the chart below, which Bible translation has the greatest percentage of short words and the smallest percentage, smallest percentage of long words? No, it's not the NIV. It's the, it finishes sixth. No, it isn't the NRSV with its fifth place finish or the New King James with its fourth place finish. It isn't, it isn't even the NASV. He loves to say V instead of B, which is what they prefer. But anyway, with its third place finish, none of the translations with new in their name even comes close. The first place winner by a whisker over the RSV is none other than the authorized version or King James version. So entire Bible, short word versus long word percentage. Uh, the King James is at 88.3% short words and 11.7% long words. And that beats out the RSV, again, by a whisker, 88.27. Again, I ask, is that statistically significant? But I ask the more important question, but what if the short word is no longer known or used? So in my book or in my documentary, I can't remember which one, maybe both, I talked about the word call, which occurs, occurs in the King James, C-A-U-L. I'll put it up on the screen. That's a short word. Do you know what it means? I did not. I came across it in the King James Version, and I had to look it up. Short does not necessarily mean easier any more than the height of Germans means they're better at basketball. Okay, let's go to my next little tab. I'm going to try to be efficient with this little evaluation. He gets into talking about the words and sentence averages in the Old Testament. He makes some observations on the stats that he collected. He says, Although it languishes in the lower portion of the New Testament and entire Bible standings, the NIV catapults to the top here. This is the word, uh, words per sentence average with impressively short sentences. So the NIV has impressively short sentences. Like many of the modern versions, the NIV does not necessarily follow the sentence structure of the Hebrew or Greek, as it feels free to break up one sentence in the original into two or more sentences. Now that is true, and he's definitely onto something. This technique is quite effective in reducing the number of words per sentence. Well, obviously, as well it should be. Shortening English sentences in a translation, however, may require unwarranted deviations from the original. Now, that may be true, too. But if you take Paul's famously long sentence in the beginning of Ephesians, it almost just begs to be broken up. Like, English just cannot handle it. Part of translation is sometimes introducing sentence divisions that are not in the original. That is a necessary part of translation. I appreciated his honesty in observing this, but I wrote in the margin, shorter is better when the King James wins, but bad when the NIV does. He can't just let the NIV win in any category. Okay, here he notes that the King James has an overall average of 20.00 words per sentence the lowest Old Testament average of the seven translations. But as dark as this picture may seem to loyal of the King James, there is hope. Do you remember those proscribed guidelines for clear and effective writing? Okay, he gave these guidelines from, I don't know what proscribe is, but they say that our sentences should contain from 15 to 20 words if we're interested in clear and effective writing. The King James's average Old Testament word sentence score last, is last place, but it still falls within these proscribed guidelines, he says. And I just wrote in the margin, you know, I edit articles all the time, and I grade papers for various schools. I've had professors at times hire me actually to grade their papers, a little known secret there. And I don't know that I've ever marked anybody off or marked them higher for sentence length. Now, that is a factor in good writing for sure. And it is true that students can sometimes tend to write run-on sentences, but by the time we get to grad school, which is where I peg all the translators of the modern English versions and the King James translators for that matter, I just don't end up having to mention that. And so I ask again, okay, is the number of words in a sentence one of the major determinants for readability? Well, it's only one factor counting just isn't enough. There's way more that goes into whether a sentence is readable or not. There's a lot of subtle stuff. Is it is the author using words that his audience knows? Is he varying his sentence length? Is she writing sentences that flow together? Is he or she writing about a topic that people find accessible or something that they find very difficult? There's just so much more than mere length. Computers can count. Sure they can, and that's what this whole book is based on. 
But that is not the most interesting and not the most useful fact about any English sentence or any English paragraph or any English book. It really is as if D.A. Waite Jr. looked at all the major modern English Bible translations, set them up against the King James Version, and looked through a tiny keyhole and came out reporting that the Bible is keyhole-shaped. There's just so much more to readability than that. He used two different methods of counting, though they all boil down to the kind of thing I talk about in my book, The Flesh Kincaid Analysis, where basically you're counting sentence length and you're counting word length, syllables in, in, sent, in words. And basically the upshot is we kind of presume that other things being equal, which this book doesn't address, shorter is going to be easier. So, okay, trying to be super efficient here, there really are just two more things that I'd like to show you in this book. And I skipped over the most important one that happens right at the beginning, because if only D.A. Waite Jr. actually understood the person he is quoting he would have realized that his entire book was a fruitless effort that delivers no useful information. And I do mean that. No useful information given the purposes, the comparative readability of the authorized version. Nothing he says in this book with all his charts actually answers the question, how readable is the King James versus other Bible translations? And I know this because of the very person that he quotes, David Crystal, whose book on the King James I have and have read most of. Waite Jr. writes, some may wonder how valid readability formulas are in predicting the readability of a particular text. Absolutely, I wonder that. Most of the 50 or so formulas for determining reading difficulty presuppose that word length and or sentence length alone determines readability. That's exactly right, because all of the computers are looking at the text that they're measuring through the only keyhole available to computers, which is stuff that the computers can count. How long are the sentences? How many syllables are in the words? So wait is to his credit, raising this very issue. As David Crystal reminds us in the 1987 Cambridge Encyclopedia of Language, page 252, however, there is no neat correlation between sentence length and difficulty. And not all long words are difficult to read. Did you catch that? There is no neat correlation between sentence length and difficulty. I just edited a very long sentence sent to me by one of the copy editors for Bible Study Magazine, and I did uh, cut it down. I split it into multiple sentences, but I was reminded of situations in which that isn't necessary and the sentences are nonetheless still easy to understand. That is when the sentence ends with a long list of things. The sentence may end up being very long, but the structure still ends up being simple. To give a very simple example, I'm about to go to Walmart when I leave the office today, and I'm going to get some milk, some bananas, some apples, some bread, some pants, some socks, some deodorant, some etc, etc, etc. I can keep that sentence going on for a long time, and it's not a difficult sentence because all of the individual words within it are things are, are labels for things that are commonly known, and the structure of the sentence itself is very simple. So sentence length does not necessarily equate to difficulty. Likewise, you toss a word like call, C-A-U-L, into your sentence, and it may be very short. Hey, toss me that call. But if somebody doesn't know what a call is, it doesn't matter how short the sentence is, doesn't matter that every single word that I've used in that sentence, hey, toss me that call, is a one-syllable word, the meaning of the sentence is going to be totally opaque to the person who doesn't know that keyword. Mr. Crystal continues by pointing out that most readability formulas fail to stress important criteria such as, and here he quotes Crystal, complexity of sentence construction, that's just what I was talking about, and the nature of word meaning. As a result, this is back to weight, Crystal mentions that many have found fault with the various readability formulas. And I just say, no, duh. I have listed out over 50 false friends in the King James Version. 50 false friends in the King James is my YouTube series. You can go look it up if you haven't seen any of them. Simple words like study and remove and command. Simple phrases like so that and on and on and on. Not endlessly, but up to, I think I did 51 or maybe I've done 52 now. I, I added to my 50 false friends series. I couldn't help myself. The nature of word meaning has to be figured into readability. There are also 
hundreds, I don't know, I haven't counted them, a lot of King James only us have actually, of dead words in the King James, words that we no longer use, words like call, C-A-U-L, that people just don't know. That has to be considered for readability, especially given the fact that the contemporary versions are much less likely to be using archaic terminology. That's the main matter at issue. Does the King James use words that people don't know anymore where the contemporary versions use words that people do. I would say the second major issue right behind that is syntax, word order. Frequently, the King James does follow the Hebrew and Greek word order in ways that make it a little awkward for contemporary readers, in ways that really aren't necessary because they didn't totally finish translating. I'm not even criticizing them. I think there's some value in that for some students of Hebrew and Greek, but for the average reader, the plowboy that the Bible is supposed to be translated for, that's got to be figured into the readability statistics. But this is what Waite says. In spite of all the criticism aimed at readability formulas, however, Mr. Crystal concludes his comments with these significant words, and he quotes Crystal here. And by the way, Crystal is an expert. He does know what he's talking about. But in the absence of more sophisticated measures, readability formulas continue to attract widespread use as a reasonably convenient way of predicting, though not explaining, reading difficulty. This is Waite himself quoting the words that ought to undercut and eliminate all of his work. He doesn't express any curiosity or go on any further about the nature of word meaning and the complexity of sentence construction. He just goes back to looking through that keyhole at the tall Germans and the short whoever's. I've gone on at greater length about readability formulas in another video or two on my YouTube channel, in my authorized documentary, and in my book, Authorized. If you want to dig into the nerdy details, they're actually really fun. I had a lot of fun with this one. For example, I made an exercise in which I replaced every other word, or was it every other syllable, in a King James paragraph with either bub or nub. And as long as you're just replacing syllables with the equivalent number of syllables, you get the same readability analysis figure at the end. Or you could go through and replace every other word in a King James paragraph with a Swedish word. Same with the NIV, with any text. And as long as those Swedish words have the same number of syllables of the words they're replacing, the readability analysis will come up with the same number. But quite obviously, if you replace half the words in an English paragraph with Swedish words, it's going to be more difficult for English speakers to read. And in fact, the weights ought to know better. Because around, I think, the same time that they produced this book, I say they, you know, it was, it was Junior, but endorsed by the father. They also put out something that they advertise in the back of the book. The defined King James Bible with uncommon words defined. I have a copy of this. And they actually did a quite good job finding all of the uncommon words in the archaic English of the King James Version and putting their contemporary English equivalents in the margins. And yet that aspect of readability figures not a wit in this book. It, it really is unbelievable to me that anybody could put this much work into something, as well as having helped, I think, produce a defined King James Bible, and not put the two together, recognizing that the nature of words, whether they're still used, what order they're put in, and whether they're used differently than they were in the King James's day, whether all that has as much to do with readability as counting up the stuff that computers can count. The fact is that it doesn't. I don't know what to say for the people who are persuaded by this kind of argumentation. He just seems to want to confute people by overwhelming them with charts when the answer to the question that he raises is sitting here right on page 8 in the wisdom of a man, David Crystal, who actually knows what he's talking about when it comes to English and English readability. By all means, spend $12 on this book, or just send it to me because I saved you from having to spend it. The Bible says, have I said this before on this channel, edification requires intelligibility. Charts do not tell me how readable a text is. People do. Readers do. I encourage everybody out there in the King James only world who is, as the Bible says you ought to be, open to reason. That's what wisdom that is from above is like. To simply pick up a contemporary Bible translation and read at least one whole book. Let's say Genesis. Maybe read the whole Pentateuch. Read some Psalms. Read some of your favorite Psalms. 
try to stomach that feeling of why did they change this? Why did they change this? Table that for a future time when you can go back and study those things. Send me some of those questions. I'd be happy to answer them, possibly privately. I do this all the time or possibly on the channel. Sweep away all of the flesh Kincaid statistics that might be cluttering your mind. The King James is at sixth grade reading level. The NIV is at a whatever reading level. And just read. And you, not flesh, not Kincaid, not D.A. Waite Jr., you be the judge.